Hello, my European and American friends. I'm from Russia. My name is Alexander Alexinian. For you, I'm just a villain from Russia. I'm the author of this documentary, and while we still have such an opportunity, let's talk. The main thing that modern European and Americans are proud of is freedom and democracy. And that's good, since I sincerely hope that you're free and democratic people. If that's the case, then you are bound to hear another point of view. I'm not asking you to believe me, I'm merely asking you to hear us, too. Listen to both sides and decide for yourself whom to believe. Or better yet, trust yourself. After all, that is what true freedom is. Today the probability of a Third World War is estimated to be more than 50%. This is said not only by experts from all over the world, but also by high-ranking politicians and generals. The prospect of nuclear conflict, once unthinkable, is now back within the realm of possibility. Tonight, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov with a chilling warning. The risk of nuclear war is a real one. You know, everything the administration of US President Joe Biden is doing now reminds me of the hell of a movie Don't Look Up with the wonderful actor Leonardo DiCaprio. I heard there's an asteroid or a comet or something that, that you don't like the looks of. <sighs> tell me about it and then tell me why you're telling me about it. You got 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Madam President, this comet is what we call a planet killer. This could be exactly 99.78% to be exact. Oh, great. Okay, so it's on 100%. Well, scientists never like to say 100%. I'm the fucking chief of staff boy with the dragon tattoo, so I'm doing fine. In this movie, the US administration tried to control a huge comet flying to Earth in order for the billionaires to become multi billionaires. You can imagine. <laughs> wow. Just how happy we were at fast from when our astrogeologists uh, discovered and then determined that this comet hurtling towards us from deep space actually contains at least 32 trillion dollars of these critical materials <laughs> critical to technology i'm sorry if is, that, is that why you aborted this entire mission is because you're, you're trying to mine the comet Dr. for Mindy, rare I think we should hold what is <laughs> what, are, what are these trillions of dollars even matter if, if we're all going to die from the impact it's about of this to ask the same question. same as now biden wants to control the third world war to make the rich american people even more disgustingly rich do you really want to know What's going on? Yeah. Kate, Kate, Kate. They found a bunch of gold and diamonds in rare shit on the comet. So they're gonna let it hit the planet to make a bunch of rich people even more disgustingly rich. As in this movie, Kate DiBiasco was made into an anti-hero for society, because she tried to tell the truth and disrupt the insane plan of the White House. And now, Russia has become such an anti-hero. And here I have to admit that, unfortunately, Russia is trying to convey the truth in the same ridiculous manner as Kate DiBiasco did with Dr. Randall Mendy. As a matter of fact, send this film to Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, please. I think they would be interested in seeing it also. But unlike the movie Don't Look Up, this documentary is about a real life. It's about what's happening right now. This is not a joke. This is not an entertainment show. This is not a Hollywood action movie. This film is also about your real life, which may soon change a lot. If it hasn't changed already, depending on when you watch this documentary. To avoid you getting confused and have any unanswered questions, I'll tell you about everything in order. Be patient. Get comfortable and be all eyes. Believe me, it's worth it. So, Russia attacked Ukraine and started a war in Europe. Is that true? 
Well, not really. In fact, the war in Ukraine has been going on for eight years. The truth is that Russia has officially intervened in an already ongoing war. However, you will not see this information in the TV news. But I'm here to share it with you. All the facts given in my film are easily checked on Google in a matter of minutes. In general, what is Ukraine? Ukraine is a country that was formed as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. This country is a very closely connected with Russia in every sense of the word. And what is this Soviet Union? This is the same Russia just in a different form. Russia is the legal successor of the Soviet Union. For example, if the United Kingdom collapses, then Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England will remain. England will become the legal successor of Great Britain. Until 2014, according to official data alone, more than 8 million ethnic Russians lived in Ukraine. These people are not immigrants, but people born in these lands. And for more than 50 million residents of Ukraine, Russian was the first native language. For example, there's a lot of French-speaking people in Canada, a lot of German-speaking people in Austria, a lot of Italians and French in Switzerland, and almost everyone in Ireland speak English. In 2014, a revolution and a civil war took place in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. The civil war between Russians and Ukrainians. This is how it happened. All this was arranged by the United States in order to get rid of Russian population and take control of Ukraine. You may ask what made me decide that the USA arranged it. Well, since you may not believe me, then believe in the confession of the Americans themselves. We've invested over five billion dollars to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. This is the same, the same Tory Newland who was caught on tape several years ago scheming about how to end democracy in Ukraine. Here's Newland in a leaked audio recording plotting the overthrow of Ukraine's democratically elected president. Listen as Newland rattles off a list of potential puppets to install in place of the democratically elected I president. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to press conference. Said, "No, nah, I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours." If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. American President Joe Biden, then Vice President, didn't hide the fact that he paid money to Ukrainian President Poroshenko and demanded the dismissal of pro-Russian officials in Ukraine. Admit it sounds like a pretty corrupt democracy. I think these facts are enough for you not to doubt just how deeply the US administration is involved in Ukrainian affairs. So, in 2014, radical Nazis, together with supporters of the European Union and NATO, carried out a bloody cope in the capital of Ukraine, Kiev. They called it Yeromaidan. 
All these terrible events were also covered by the Western media, openly supporting radicals and outrageous lawlessness. Right after the overthrow of the government, the radicals began to persecute those who disagree with them. Almost all over the country pressure has begun on everything related to Russians. They were getting beaten and oppressed. There were clashes breaking out everywhere and even murders. Immediately after coming to power, the new parliament deprived the Russian language of the regional status. The Russian language was completely removed from all educational programs. Of course, this greatly worried the Russian population due to them mainly living in the eastern and southern parts of Ukraine. And they began to resist, not recognizing the new government of Ukraine, the government that they did not choose. They came into power illegally with help of violence and blood, that openly discriminated Russians and openly supported the Nazi movements. But we'll talk about fascism a bit later. Observing these persecutions, Crimea refused to recognize the new government, declaring its desire to join Russia. A referendum was held in Crimea, where 96% of the population voted for Crimea's secession from Ukraine and joining Russia. Take note of this fact. Crimea voluntarily joined Russia, because it was afraid not unreasonably of the new Ukraine's authority. Russia did not seize Crimea. There was no war. No one died. Crimea came to Russia of its own free will. In addition, the Russian Black Sea Navy was based in the Crimea, in the city of Sevastopol, which was built even in 1783. It was founded by the Russian Empress Catherine II. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and creation of the Ukraine in 1991, after the agreement between Russia and Ukraine, the territory of the novel port was leased to Russia for a period up to 2042. But the new leadership of Ukraine intended to expel the Russians from there, because they were going to join NATO. The US Department of Defense has already announced a tender for construction of military facilities in Crimea. Sevastopol for Russia is like a Pearl Harbor for the USA. It's even more historical and native. The Black Sea never has the same symbolic importance of the victory over fascism as the Pearl Harbor for the Americans. Imagine that Russia staged an uprising in Hawaii, and the new Hawaiian government wants to remove the American base Pearl Harbor and place a Russian base there. Just imagine! And now think how crazy it sounded for Russia the American naval base in the Crimea, in Sevastopol. That is, after Crimea joined Russia, the pressure on the Russians in the rest of Ukraine got worse. And mass pogroms of Russians began. In the city of Odessa, in 2014, an entire building with Russian people inside was burned down, because they protested against the Russophobia. People were burned alive, simply because they're Russians. The involvement of the new government of Ukraine in this massacre is proved by one simple fact. So far, none of these criminals are in prison. Note that when a person jumped out of the window trying to escape from the fire, he was beaten with a bat. What kind of animals can do this? I just can't wrap my mind around this. Please tell me, how would France react? if the French were burned alive in Belgium? How would Germany react if Germans were burned in Austria? The British The Guardian wrote about the events in Odessa. Only the editors of the magazine did not see anything terrible in this, and of course in the end the dead victims were blamed. And although the West did not see anything terrible in this, the events in Odessa really shocked all of the Russians.
The burning of people alive terrified two other Russian-speaking regions, which refused to obey the new authorities, declaring themselves independent. These are Donetsk and Lugansk regions, which also called by the common name Donbass. And since these regions did not join Russia, but only became independent, the new Ukrainian government dared to start a military campaign against them. That's how the war in Ukraine began. The counting of the war begins from this very moment. The lie of the Western media is that the war began only now, in 2022. This is such a brazen lie. I can't even believe their decision to do this. Is it possible to hide a war that was widely covered by news media on a worldwide scale in 2014? The first hottest phase of the Donbass war went on for a whole year. On the one hand, the Ukrainian army. On the other hand, the Russian population of Donbass to whom Russia naturally expressed support. Official figures show that during the first year of the war more than 13,000 people were killed, including more than 6,000 civilians of Donbass. Unofficially, more than 13,000 civilians died. Hundreds of children were also killed, in whose honor the memorial alley of angels was built. During the year of this war, the Ukrainian army conquered half of the Donbass territory, destroying everything to shambles. They bombed populated areas in the harshest possible way. Google Maps will show you how many houses have been wiped off the face of the earth. But no one in the world has beaten the alarm as they're doing now. No one called for stopping the war. Nobody cared. Hollywood stars, Western politicians, actors, humanists, athletes, activists. Nobody cared. In 2015, Ukraine, with the meditation of Russia, France, Germany and Belarus, signed a ceasefire agreement. This is not a peace treaty, this is a ceasefire agreement. That is, the war has been stopped for a diplomatic solution of the conflict. But the Ukrainian army after 2015, that is after the agreement, still systematically violated the ceasefire. There were regular firefights. Let's talk about Nazism. If earlier the Nazi movements were underground, then thanks to Euromaidan they came out of hiding in 2014. If earlier the Nazi movements were only civil, then with the beginning of the Donbass war it turned into a completely military formation. This is an analogue of Hitler's SS unit. They even took the SS emblem. Just take a look at these shots. The military unit called Azov. It has up to 10,000 highly trained fighters. This is not an underground organization, but an official part of the Ukrainian army. The unit is directly funded from the state budget. This NATO unit, besides of participating in Donbass war, is engaged in kidnapping inconvenient people for the Kyiv regime, acting as unofficial punishers for the leadership of Ukraine. Torture of people has become commonplace in Ukraine. I can show you how the Azov fighters torture people, otherwise the film will fall under the 18 plus category, but you can easily find videos of torture on Google. Nazi ideology has spread to all segments of the population. It's funny, but back in 2014, the BBC released a report with the headline Neo-Nazi Threat in New Ukraine. Sometimes they carry guns. We met these men posing for pictures outside the burnt-out remains of what was once their headquarters. 
I asked them about their political beliefs. Apparently then, some BBC journalists were still unbiased. What about the kids? The actual kids? They are brought up by the neo-Nazi unit Azov. The military Nazi organization, which is engaged in kidnapping and torture of people, educates Ukrainian children. Will someone else say that there is no neo-Nazism in Ukraine? Is this all fiction? In 2019, the American government brought to power an even more puppet president of Ukraine, Mr. Zelensky who previously had nothing to do with politics. He was just a popular comedian. Yes, that was the president of Ukraine, Zelensky. Do you know why he won the election? He played a tough president in a popular Ukrainian humorous series. Such choice of a president can be explained by Jewish roots of Mr. Zelensky. By this fact, the Ukrainian government wanted to wash away the dirty past of 2014 and hide the Nazism of the current regime. This was supposed to be a counter-argument against Nazism in Ukraine. As a matter of fact, the guesses were confirmed. President Zelensky was democratically elected. He's Jewish. His father's family was wiped out in the Nazi Holocaust. U.S. President Joe Biden began using Mr. Zelensky's Jewish roots as a counter-argument. But at the same time already in 2021, at the UN meeting on the resolution of banning the glorification of the Nazis out of the all of the countries, only the USA and Ukraine voted against it. That is, they voted for the glorification of Nazism. Again, in the 21st century, the USA and Ukraine voted for the glorification of Nazism. Even Germany, Hitler's homeland, abstained from the vote. Back to Zelensky. After he came to power in 2019, Ukraine's rhetoric became even more belligerent. Zelensky began very actively arming the army with American and NATO offensive weapons. NATO trains tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers to fight. It's not a secret. The NATO Secretary General made it clear. Um, we have to remember that NATO allies, like the United States, but also the United Kingdom and Canada, and some others, they have trained Ukrainian troops for years, so tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops. War. Over the last eight years, the United States, Canada, Britain, other allies uh, really helped train the Ukrainians in, in small unit leadership, command and control, uh, operational maneuver. No one asked, why are you preparing the army of a foreign state for war? The Ukrainian military forces were preparing for war, as not to defense, but to attack. Speaking ahead even now, during the war, the Ukrainian army lacks on air defense systems. Zelensky asks NATO every day to close the sky over Ukraine. This once again shows that the Ukrainian army has been preparing all this time not to defend itself, but to attack. Because otherwise, they would have bought air defense systems instead of attack drones. Now let's move on. In 2020, Azerbaijan launched a war against Armenia, Russia's military ally. Turkey, a NATO member, openly supported Azerbaijan militarily and politically. By the way, no one then wanted to stop Turkey and Azerbaijan as they want to stop Russia now. 
At that time, that was the biggest military conflict in the world. In 44 days, 10,000 people died on both sides. Azerbaijanis tortured civilians to death while filming it and posting the videos online. And they bombed peaceful cities. It turns out that there are chosen nations who are worth worrying about, and there are those whose lives are worthless. The Armenian-Azerbaijani war ended with a truce, and now in a state of freezing. Shootings still do not stop. Right now the situation there is tense again and could flare up at any moment. Or maybe it is already. It all depends on when you watch this documentary. In the same year, 2020, in parallel with the Armenian-Azerbaijani war, the United States attempted a bloody revolution in Belarus, another allied country of Russia. The attempt failed, but the internal situation in Belarus continued to be extremely tense. After the Armenian-Azerbaijani war and the Belarusian events in 2020, Zelensky officially and openly began making promises to Ukrainians that he will soon return to Donbass and Crimea under control. Ukrainian journalists and politicians on state television directly threatened Russia with war. И я уважаю Азербайджан за то, что они пришли и забрали свое. И я начну уважать свое государство, когда мы придем и заберем свое. That was the most popular journalist in Ukraine, who demanded to start a war for the return of Crimea and Donbass under control. By the end of the 2021, the situation between Ukraine and Donbass plunged into crisis. Ukrainian troops have amassed on the front line. In response, Russia amassed troops to its borders with Ukraine. Russia has explicitly warned that it will not tolerate an attack on Donbass. Russian troops along the Ukrainian border were supposed to contain Ukraine and convince it not to start a new bloody war as it was in 2014. Russia demanded that Ukraine adhere to the OSCE Minsk Agreement on a Ceasefire, which Ukraine signed in 2015. But Ukraine has publicly reneged on its promises. I repeat, Ukraine has publicly refused a diplomatic solution of the conflict. After that, the degree of tension increased by another level, since it became clear that Ukraine will soon begin a second military campaign against Donbass. Russia, well aware that Ukraine is being pushed toward war with Russia and that war will begin soon, has stated that its patience is at its limit. This is why, at the end of 2021, Putin officially made a security proposal to Europe and named his red lines. He offered to give guarantees that Ukraine will not join NATO, will adhere to a neutral status and that the United States will no longer touch neighboring countries. You can find the full text of the Russian proposal of a mutual security guarantees yourself on the internet. I think personally you will agree if not completed and at least partially on these conditions, because they are more than mutually beneficial and safe for everyone. But the US and NATO members refused to even discuss the proposal and essentially told Russia to bugger off. Moreover, they ridiculed the offer. You see, they refused to acknowledge Russia's security needs at all. They treated Russia as if it's some kind of African country, let's say Somalia. Be sure to remember another fact. Ukraine has also renounced its neutral status. This dispels any illusions about poor, peaceful, democratic Ukraine, which has certainly attacked for no reason. Ukraine has refused all proposals for a peaceful resolution of the conflict. But that's not all. With the beginning of the 2022, right during the New Year holidays, the United States launched another COP attempt in Kazakhstan, again a military ally of Russia. Kazakhstan is a very important ally for Russia. The Russian Baikonur Cosmodrome is located in there. The first human flight into space was made by Yuri Gagarin from this point. The New Year was a holiday for everyone, but not for the Kazakhs. We 
стороне, в Алматы, Октаву и других городах. Mass armed riots and an attempted cope began on anti-Russian sentiments. Everything was already so dangerous that at the request of the official Kazakh authorities, Russia sent troops to protect strategic facilities, including such as the Baikonur Cosmodrome. As a result of armed riots, more than 200 people were killed. Western news outlets also covered it, and obviously they supported the radicals. Few surprises there. In the USA you can end up behind bars for insulting a police officer, but in Kazakhstan shooting a police officers is a fight for a freedom. Democracy, you know. But the most interesting thing is that the Western media called the protection of strategic facilities an invasion to Kazakhstan. It is so absurd. Kazakhstan is a military ally of Russia. Russian troops secured important facilities during armed disorders. This happened at the request of the official authorities of Kazakhstan. But the West called it Russian invasion of Kazakhstan. It's like calling the presence of American troops in Poland an invasion. So the US succeeded in spilling blood in Kazakhstan. A lot of blood. And creating radical organizations. Everything was very similar to the Ukrainian scenario of 2014. And yet, they failed to pull off this cope. And for sure, United States decided to make up for its failure in Kazakhstan by starting the war in Donbass. Almost immediately after Kazakhstan, the Ukrainian attacks in Donbass became more frequent. It came to the point that the civilians had to be evacuated, and the leadership of Donbass, together with the residents, publicly appealed to Russia for help. Can you imagine how tense the situation was? And what else could be done to escalate the whole thing even more? And here's what. To declare that Ukraine intends to get nuclear weapons. Yes, you heard that right. Literally a week before the start of Russia's special military operation in Ukraine, Zelensky made a statement that Ukraine could become a nuclear state. Я ініціюю проведення консультацій у рамках Будапештського меморандуму. Скликати їх доручено міністру закордонних справ. Якщо вони знову не відбудуться, або за їх результатами не буде гарантій безпеки для нашої держави, Україна матиме повне право вважати, що Будапештський меморандум не працює і усі пакетні рішення 94-го року були поставлені під сумнів. Now let's make a pause. Do you understand how serious this statement is and how much it threatens Russia, especially given such high tensions? Just imagine what America would do if Mexico declared its intention to become a nuclear weapons state, or a Cuba. America invaded Iraq under such pretext. All through Iraq has never made such statements. This was just the assumption of American politicians, who never found anything similar to nuclear weapons in Iraq. When are you going to apologize for the million Iraqis that are dead because you lied? You lied about weapons of mass destruction? You lied about connections to 9-11? You lied about Iraq being you a threat. You, you sent me to Iraq. You sent me to Iraq in 2003. My friends are dead. You you killed people. You lied. You lied about WMD. A million Iraqis are dead because you lied. My friends are dead because you lied. You need to apologize. And look where Iraq and the USA are located. There are whole oceans, seas, and deserts between Iraq and America. While Ukraine is a neighboring state of Russia, officially declares its intention to obtain the status of a nuclear weapon state. Meanwhile, Ukraine has territorial claims to Russia and threatens it with war. Zelensky's statement became a critical factor for Russia to intervene and launch a military operation. This was the last red line for Russia. Yeah. 
Recently, amid the ongoing military operation, Zelensky has made another statement on nuclear weapons. Ukraine is ready to go nuclear-free. Apparently, Zelensky believes that this is a big compromise. But what's important here is that his statement again confirms that Ukraine is still striving to obtain nuclear weapons. And now let's summarize the whole thing. In 2003, an anti-Russian revolution took place in neighboring Georgia. In 2004, three of Russia's neighboring countries joined NATO at once. You can go to jail there now just for using the Russian language. In 2008, Georgia applied to join NATO, then attacked Russian peacekeepers in Ossetia. And the peacekeepers were there absolutely legally, in accordance with the UN mandate. As the result of the attack on Russian peacekeepers, the Russian-Georgian war begins. In 2014, the cope in Ukraine began. I have just told you about it in detail. In 2018, a revolution took place in Armenia and pro-American people came to power. However, they do not openly pursue an anti-Russian policy, because most Armenians do not support an anti-Russian policy. In 2020, the Armenian-Azerbaijani war with the support of NATO member Turkey. In 2020, there was a widespread unrest in Belarus. In 2021, the opposition leader Navalny with the support of the United States was trying to organize a revolution in Russia. The US support was so evident that they even imposed sanctions against Russia because of Navalny. In 2022, there was a bloody attempt at revolution in Kazakhstan. Immediately after that, the new war crisis secured in the Donbass. And right during this escalation, Zelensky announced the nuclear status of Ukraine. Now tell me, do you really think that Russia is the aggressor in this story? Don't you think that Russia has always avoided spilling blood? The war was going to Russia, not Russia to war. Is it NATO coming towards Russia? Or is Russia moving towards NATO? The closer NATO is to Russia, the more blood there is around. What an interesting pattern, isn't it? You have to be blind not to understand who is the aggressor here, who starts the war and who is its instigator. I think the one place where the greatest consternation would be caused in the short term for admission, having nothing to do with the merit and preparedness of the country to come in, would be to admit the Baltic states now in terms of NATO-Russian, U.S.-Russian relations. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance were it to be tipped in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction, I don't mean military, in Russia, it would be that. You accuse Russia of launching a full-scale military campaign against the Ukrainian regime. Okay, and what should Russia have done? Just watch how Ukraine destroys Donbass with the Russian population. Wait until all the Allies are made enemies of Russia, kill and expel Russian people from there, create a fascist army, get a nuclear bomb and all together attack Russia. Would it be reasonable for Russia to wait for such outcomes? You will surely tell me now, okay, this is understandable. Let's say that Russia had no other choice. But why Russia is bombing schools and residential buildings in Ukraine? And you're right. Russia indeed is bombing schools and residential buildings. But there are no children in these schools. Заехала техника между двух школ. Вот она, доблестная армия Украины. If you refer to these people as children or students, you need to see your doctor. There are no civilians in those buildings. All of them are in bomb shelters. And this is who is in there, and here's what they do. Oh, what 
There are hundreds and thousands of such video proofs. They just won't show them to you. You will probably ask now. Are all Ukrainians like that neo-Nazis, militants and bandits? Of course not. Not all of them. The Ukrainian people are super talented and peaceful. I'll show you what happens to people who dare to express their own opinion. Denis Kirev is a member of the official Ukrainian delegation, who went to negotiate with the Russian delegation at the third day of the war. During the negotiations, he offered to compromise with Russia to stop the bloodshed. The next day, when the delegation returned to Ukraine, he was simply killed and thrown out like garbage. And the government of Ukraine has confirmed his murder. Do you know what happens to Ukrainians who wants to evacuate from cities and express their disagreement? That's what happens to them. None of the common sense Ukrainians you know and pray for, for whom I pray too, will even dare to criticize the fascist regime in Ukraine. They're all simply afraid. Look at what's happening in this country. These were acts of lynching, hundreds and thousands of them. At the same time, Ukrainian sources themselves publish it. They are proud of it. All these people are either left to die of exhaustion, or the dead bodies of lynched people are thrown out in the streets. But they won't show it to you. Well, maybe they will, but with the switching of roles. They'll show you the same bodies on the streets and say, Russians did it. You'll see. They won't show you their crimes in European countries. They won't show you the Ukrainian vandalism and how they graffiti their flags and Nazi symbols in your countries. They also won't show you how the Russian military is providing humanitarian and medical aid for Ukrainians. Why would they? After all, the US administration ordered to make the Russians look like villains. Instead, they will show topless and nude Ukrainian protesters in Paris. They will tell you Ukraine is a victim and Zelensky is a hero. And you, Europeans and Americans, should support Ukraine at the expense of your taxes, finances, 
and soon at the expense of your lives. Did I say soon? Sorry, that's the wrong word. That's what I said when I wrote a script for this documentary. Now, by the time of filming, you're already giving your lives for the sake of Biden's whims. My name's Jax, I'm from uh, England. And basically we're here to uh, help stop the invasion of Ukraine. I don't know if you guys know what this was behind me. Just a little while ago, uh, brought to the rear with a tank. Got my man right there, my commander. He's got the USA patch on his shoulder. Artillery shell exploded five feet from me and uh, peppered my face. They're lying to you. 90% of what they say is fake news and lies. Listen, I'm not saying you have to believe me. No, trust your own judgment. Just look at both sides of the coin and decide for yourself who to believe. But you are being deprived of the opportunity to see our point of view. Because they are afraid that you will find out the truth. So where is the fucking democracy? Where is freedom of speech? You have to break through the information blockade to become free. Free from manipulation and brainwashing. Let's return to the topic of nuclear war. You probably think, no, it's impossible. America would not give nuclear weapons to Ukraine. America will not start a nuclear war. Are you sure about this? Then why America's nuclear weapons are in Turkey, Germany, Italy, Belgium and Netherlands right now? Why are they going to deploy their nuclear weapons in Poland and Ukraine? Who is this weapon against? Why does Europe need American nuclear weapons at all? After all, Europe has its own nuclear weapons to defend itself. France, for example, has them. Perhaps because France will never use its nuclear weapons against Russia? But Biden's puppets in Germany may well. Radical Nazis from Ukraine may as well. The United States is the only country in the world whose nuclear weapons are located on the territory of other countries. Have you forgotten that the US invented nuclear weapons? Moreover, the US is the only country to use nuclear weapons. Now I will give you some historical data that may shock you. Hold on tight. In 1945, immediately after the end of the World War II and the death of Hitler, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered the creation of an attack plan on Russia, the Soviet Union at the time. The plan was called the Unthinkable. For many years Britain denied the existence of such a plan. In 1998, the plan was declassified and transferred to the National Archives of Britain. The very existence of such a plan is not as shocking as its details. Churchill wanted to restore the German fascist army and incite it against Russia. All German prisoners were to be released and armed for war with Russia. So as Poles, Ukrainians and other Nazis of the Hitler period had to fight. German industry with the support of Britain and the United States had to provide the rear of the war against Russia. This was a plan of war carried out by the hands of others including those who mercilessly bombed London a few years ago. The plan was so inhumane, so Churchill himself dared to call it the unthinkable. In conjunction with the plan's development, Churchill began to prepare the British mentally for war. A few months later, the victorious leader of Britain took part in the elections with the militant slogans Let's finish the job. The British people who have already seen a lot of blood did not live up to Churchill's expectations. The people turned out to be wise and outrageously reacted to the idea of starting a new war. Fortunately, Churchill lost this vote and went into opposition. This did not prevent him from saying his famous speech, Churchill's Fulton speech a year after the defeat. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. 
behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all are subject, in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from, uh, from Moscow. Another person who hated Russians came to support this speech, the US President Harry Truman, who had his own plan to destroy Russia. Churchill's plan to revive the fascist army was nothing compared to Eisenhower's plan, called totality. This plan was also kept in secret for a long time, but Russian intelligence service revealed it. At first the United States did not acknowledge it, and then they were forced to admit the existence of such a document. The plan was so monstrous that it was impossible to justify it in the minds of the world community. Therefore, the Americans said that this plan was a bluff. It was a deliberate misinformation. Although at the same time, all the details of the plan have not yet been declassified. Funny, isn't it? The very concept of secret bluff goes beyond the bounds of common sense. It's worth clarifying that the plan was developed a few months after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, on the orders of Harry Truman. It was him who actually dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. What was Eisenhower planning? He wanted to drop 20 nuclear bombs on the largest Russian cities. That was it. The plan had an exact list of Russian cities. This plan was not executed for the reason that in 1949 Russia created its own nuclear weapons. And by that time, the United States did not manage to create the necessary number of nuclear warheads. Eisenhower became president of the United States after Harry Truman. The nuclear arms race between the United States and Russia continued in his years. John F. Kennedy replaced him. He was a young, progressive and smiling president. He advocated improving relations with Russia. But two years later he was killed in a plain view of his family. Donald Trump also advocated for improving relations with Russia. It seems he's lucky he's still alive. He got only removed from the office. And now, don't you see the renewal of all declassified plans, but just adapted to modern realities? Now, don't you see? that the anti-Russian doctrine of Harry Truman and Winston Churchill has been inherited to many modern politicians in the United States and Britain. The US administration wants nuclear war with Russia, but not directly. They want to use Ukrainians, Georgians, Kazakhs, Azerbaijanis, Poles, Germans, French, British and others. The United States will be able to colonize a weakened and almost destroyed Europe, including the European part of Russia, in a matter of days. It would seem the perfect plan by the Biden's administration to take over the world. Like an old Roman proverb says, divide and rule. From the publication of the Washington Post, the words of the US President Harry Truman. If we see that Germany is winning the war, we ought to help Russia. And if that Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany, and in that way, let them kill as many as possible. But Europe cannot stay united without the United States. There is no moral center in Europe. When in the last two centuries have the French, or the British, or the Germans, or the Belgians, or the Italians, moved in a way to unify that continent, to stand up to this kind of genocide. When have they done it? And the only reason anything is happening now is because the United States of America finally 
finally is understanding her role. But the Biden administration still didn't understood one simple thing. The world war cannot be controlled. That's what Hitler thought. And at first he did well. But we all do remember how it ended. 72 million people died because of the war unleashed by Hitler. Now crazy old Biden wants to provoke the world nuclear war and he thinks he can control everything. Even though he does not completely control himself. He is showing symptoms of Alzheimer and dementia. He even thinks that Iranians live in the Ukraine. Putin may circle Kyiv with tanks, but he'll never gain the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. Biden is the same man who years ago posted in cold blood that it was he who suggested bombing civilians in the capital of Yugoslavia. Different. I'm just want to know what you suggest because back then, when I was in your position, I was suggesting we bomb Belgrade. I was suggesting that we send American pilots in and blow up all the bridges on the Drina. I was suggesting we take out his oil supplies. And you, ordinary Americans, even if you are ruthless people and you also want a war in Europe, you cannot be sure that at some point all these countries that you have pitted against each other will not turn against you. You cannot be sure that war will not come to you and knock on your door. You can't be sure that, like in World War II, you'll be watching movies and listening to jazz while the whole of Europe is bleeding. At this time, the war is guaranteed to come to your doorsteps. Nowadays, the voice of all Russians is denied by the American social networks. Everything that shows the Russian point of view is banned. No freedom of speech and no democracy. This documentary will also be removed from my channel soon if it generates views. Though the algorithms of social networks today are designed not to recommend pro-Russian content. Therefore, as the author, I will to give all the rights to use this film entirely at any venues. On any social networks, on any YouTube and TV channels, Netflix, the film can be broadcast in any language. In particular, I give the right to use this video for monetization. The only condition is that the film's content cannot be altered. Bloggers can upload this movie to their channels and earn thousands of dollars in monetization. If you want to translate the film to your language, I will provide you with the source material and text for free. For any copyright questions, write me an email. Joe Biden's administration planted the world with hostility towards Russians. To that point that Facebook allowed calls to kill Russians. And the murders didn't wait long. Just another day, a Russian truck driver was killed in Europe simply because he was Russian. Thousands of Russian truckers in Poland were not allowed back to their homes. It was as if they had been captured. Spheres of life are politicized and militarized. Even the Oscar ceremony this year didn't go without the theme of Ukraine. Actors, singers, everyone discriminates against Russia. In Germany, restaurants and hotels do not allow Russians in. In the London Tube, there are posters saying Good Russian is dead Russian. This is not conceivable that European oncologists refuse to treat Russian children. Pharmaceutical companies are stopping the supply of medicines for patients. At the same time, the endless supply of weapons, mercenaries and American soldiers who pretend to be volunteers to Ukraine continues. Biden publicly insults the president of Russia, and other politicians from his administration are openly calling to kill Putin. You know Vladimir Putin, you think he's a killer? Mm-hmm. I do. Vladimir Putin, 
I mean, you, you, look at what he's done to these people. What does it make you think? He's a butcher. Oh, I, I, I think he is a war criminal. Do you understand what this means? This means that we are at the point of no return. All bridges are being burned and there is no going back. This means you are being prepared for a war, a big war. There is a mental preparation of the Western population. Can it be any other way? How else you will go to war against Russia if you don't hate Russians with all your heart? Just in case, let me remind you that Russia is the main nuclear armed power in the world. Although Russia is not an advanced country in computer technology and robot vacuum cleaners, it is ahead of everyone in nuclear and missile technologies. Let's not forget that it was Russia that sent the first man into space. Russia has about 7,000 missiles ready to launch with nuclear warheads and tens of thousands in reserve. Now I'll show you how fast Russian missiles launch from their positions. This is not a montage, so that you don't accuse me of propaganda, the video is taken from Western sources. This type of missile travels at 20 times the speed of sound. They launch faster than a bullet. They reach any point in Europe in less than 5 minutes. And any point in the USA in less than 15 minutes. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to scare you. I don't want that in any way. But you have to understand what kind of beast you provoke. Why would you need that? Are you having a bad life? You must understand, you can't just keep pushing a beast into a corner and mocking it. Russia may not wait until 20 nuclear strikes on its cities happens, as Eisenhower planned. You know, I want to confess in something to you. While you are being mentally prepared for a nuclear war in Europe, we Russians are already. Because even I, as being a simple person from Russia, feel cornered. I feel like the whole world wants to kill me. Since 2014 I have been under constant pressure, constant sanctions, bans, riots, economic instabilities, bloody revolutions and wars. Personally, I'm sick of it all. I'm tired of asking you to live in peace, I'm tired of asking you to respect us, I'm tired of trying to negotiate with you. Agree with me, at some times there is a point in a soul where a horrible end is better than an endless horror. We are tired of the endless blackmail of the Russians. All foreign companies, Google, YouTube, Apple, airlines, food supplying companies, all of them blackmail us, prohibiting us, restricting, depriving, demanding compliance. They all blackmail us and demand to kill our president. You always criticize Putin. He is not perfect, as we all are. Nowhere in the world are as many public Putin's critics as in Russia. I've criticized Putin's administration myself, not at once. But for all his faults, Putin has one huge advantage over most Western leaders. Putin is an independent leader who is not subordinate to anyone from outside. Putin doesn't have another president over him to tell him what to do. And that means Putin can make mistakes in his decisions, but it is evident that he makes them in the interest of his country, not someone else's. If you Americans and Europeans really stand for democracy, freedom and peace without war, the only thing I will ask from you is to search for the truth, find the truth and tell your friends.
предлагают послание? Куда? В прошлое. You can't even imagine the mental state of Russians. We have nothing left to lose. We have nowhere to retreat to. We, Russians, are mentally prepared for the worst. But we'll never stop hoping for the best. Папа, 